more familiar as time goes by. Okay, now, there we go. So, um, today's lecture, we're going to look first at what science is and to get an understanding of how science works, and particularly, of course, looking at the science of paleontology, the study of fossils. Um, and then move on, hopefully I'll get to that in time, um, at the discovery of the fossil world. And that will be, so we'll have uh, some minutes with that at the end of this lecture, and then all of Friday's lecture is going to be sort of the history of prehistory, the discovery of dinosaurs and the changing ideas of them over time. Uh, but first, um, this was sort of the breakdown, at least I, I grouped them into general categories. For those students who responded to the discussion question about what you're looking forward to, and yes, we do indeed cover all these things, and I, I may have missed some who posted after I checked. Um, that's fine, you know, we will definitely be covering these topics as part of the course. So, um, to begin with, something that the public is not as typically aware of, I think, as they should be. And that is to, you know, a musician, a performing musician, a performance is your um, unit of, of production. So you'll talk about, you know, so-and-so's concert at what, such and such a place, whatever. Or recording, if it's, you know, recording artist. Um, a composer, you know, a composition is their thing. A poet is the poet, whether it's a sonnet or an epic or whatever. To a scientist, the unit that we do, the unit of our production, are papers. That's what we do. And so our job, basically, is to produce reports, call papers, uh, that synthesize one or more analyses that we did, or sets of observations, and then we have them presented typically in a, a journal relevant to that topic or to science overall. So these are all, for instance, papers relevant to aspects of the running ability of various dinosaurs or dinosaurs in general, there's mine from long ago. Um, so scientific publications. The science proceeds by publication, and in a publication you present your hypotheses. What are hypotheses? I'll get to them shortly. Your data, and then the results of your test. Uh, and then the reason we do that is mostly so that other researchers can look at that, they can evaluate your work, they can see if they can duplicate your results, or indeed if when they try to do so they find something totally different. Um, and it serves as a record of work that you've done, and hopefully the science advances as a whole as we add bit by bit, analysis by analysis, observation by observation, to the corpus of data. Now, most scientific publications are done by what's called peer review. Peer review is where you write up your observations, tests, results, etc., conclusions. You submit it to a journal. The editors of the journal take that manuscript, and they find some number, two, three, maybe more, of uh, your uh, peers, your, your colleagues in the field, people with relevant knowledge to that topic. They send it to them. Those people then sit down, go through the paper, see if, they, if the observations and the methods and the conclusions are sound. They don't have to agree with them, but are they sound? Do you get these set of conclusions using these methods? Are these methods the appropriate ones for that sort of analysis and so forth. And then send their comments back to the journal editor who then synthesizes that information and may say, look, your reviewers found a couple problematic bits or you missed some previous relevant research or uh, whatever. Please correct that, resubmit it. Or they could say, what the hell are you talking about? You totally missed the ball, that's the tail, not the head. Um, <laughs> You know, think about the whole thing again. Think about your life choices. Okay, hopefully you don't like that. <laughs> or once in a, a blue moon, you know, it might be, oh my God, this is perfection itself. We're going to publish it as is. It's never happened to me. Not happened to the majority of researchers out there. Um, but that way, it doesn't make 
the paper true. It doesn't mean that it is without error. But at least it means before you get your information out to a larger public, you've at least had some people vet it who are knowledgeable in the field. And you might not be making blatant mistakes. And you can see the world of difference between peer-reviewed publications and self-published stuff that's out there. Of course, in this day and age, it is super easy to get self-published stuff out there on the internet. And when I say paper, some of us still use like the dead tree version of the printed material. Um, but of course, the vast majority of papers are now all electronic. In fact, there are some journals that don't exist in physical space anymore. They're all electronic. Well, people can do their own electronic publications, and they can be pretty darn wacky sometimes, utterly unconnected to reality, or utterly uninformed to the, uh, the relevant data that's out there. Um, so this won't make it true, but it will hopefully make it better. And yeah, so there are specialist journals in the field. So there's the Journal of Paleontology. That, by the way, is a whale, not a dinosaur, a proto-whale. There are some journals which cover the entire field of science. So science and nature, and the proceeding of the National Academy of Sciences, which everyone calls PNAS. Okay. Um, okay. <laughs> We're children at heart. Um, they're, um, they cover everything. You know, you will find material science, computer science, and pa paleontology, and archaeology, and cellular biology, etc. in there. And then there's some real narrow fields, like specifically about systematics and its classification within just paleontology or just vertebrate fossils or whatever. One of the main types of publications that you get relevant to paleontology are new species. We'll talk in a couple weeks about how we recognize new species and where these names come from. But one of the conclusions you could have that is present, presented in a paper is this set of fossils represents a previously unknown type of organism to which we are giving a new name. So this new name is, is in a sense a hypothesis. This is a brand new species, and this is the label we're calling it. So one measure of how the science is doing are how many new species are proposed. So in 2020, there were 44 new species of non of, of Mesozoic dinosaurs. So excluding birds, well, excluding modern birds, birds since the end of the Great Extinction, uh, but including Mesozoic birds. And here they are. One actually was proposed, turned out, Almost, was almost immediately recognized not to be a dinosaur, but in fact a lizard. So that's why it's got a scratch through that. But that remains 44 of them. So that's more than one, well, not quite one a week, but it's more than one every two weeks. We've had 19 of them so far this year. Okay, it's been a challenging year for everyone. And so even though a lot of us haven't been able to go on the field, so you might think, well, maybe you could spend more time in the lab and, and you know, do the study on it. I've got a lot of colleagues who are museum workers. They can't even, they haven't been to the lab since March of last year. So, you know, it's coming out, but it's okay. And this is, a, since 2003, I've actually been noting the number of new Mesozoic dinosaur species per year. And you can see sort of the average is in the mid-40s. Some years are really, 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 really good. Some, some less so, but... Uh, and just an example of some of the new ones from this year. Beautiful new, um, it's a beautiful new Mexican duckbill. It's not a new Mexican duckbill, although we do have those. Those are from New Mexico. This is from the nation of Mexico. Uh, it's Lattelophus. Uh, it is a tube-crested duckbill related to some other North American ones. And so, yeah, quite a lovely creature, I think. And very well preserved, good, good material on it. In fact, the paper on it doesn't just look at the anatomy, it also talks about its evolutionary relationships. So here it is in relation to some other North American ones, but also to some Eurasian ones, and actually is more closely related to these Eurasian ones based on this analysis. Um, or this paper, not a new species, but an analysis of a site 
or a couple, there's actually this is on one site, of uh, assemblage of bones and looking at the frequency of light marks on the bones and what that might reveal about the behavior of various dinosaurs. And in fact, what um, Stephanie Drumheller and her colleagues found was that there was a much higher frequency of bite marks at this particular site than other sites of the same age and general place. It's called the Morrison Formation. We'll talk a lot more about the Morrison later on. That the pattern of bite marks are consistent with two predators from that known to that environment, called Allosaurus and Ceratosaurus, and that most of the bitten specimens were themselves what we call theropod dinosaurs, that is, carnivorous dinosaurs like Allosaurus and Ceratosaurus. And that these bites were mostly from what we call lower economy bones, bones that don't have a lot of meat on them. And so it looks like this was probably a stressed environment, this particular locality, and that these particular meat eaters were making do with what they could on feeding on bones that weren't particularly good, that this was a not the best of times. And here's a, a painting by Brian Eng. Oh, his, it's, his name is here, but unfortunately I forgot to make it in white. Uh, I try to make sure I acknowledge all the artists uh, of this sort of you know, gnarly scene of, uh, of uh, Ceratosaurus and an Allosaurus munching on other dead meat eaters. And you can see the flies all over the place and so forth. Or maybe something a little less uh, uh, gory. Now, how far did a particular individual dinosaur migrate? We'll talk later on about how people have had hypotheses that dinosaurs might migrate. There have actually been both um, scientific documentaries and popular, uh, you know, mostly oriented towards kids' movies about dinosaur migration. Uh, but how do we know that they migrate? How can we test? And this particular analysis, you can see the authors here and their uh, affiliations and so forth looked at the presence of a particular set of isotopes of the element strontium as evidence of how these dinosaurs, if they moved from one, we call drainage basin, one area that's draining out from one set of river systems from the mountains versus another, and compared them looking at one individual dinosaur, so down here in B and C we see the teeth in the jaws of one dinosaur, so different teeth from the same socket remain in place in this dinosaur. The, each tooth represents the, uh, will have the strontium isotopes of the water that it was drinking or the plants it was eating at the time that tooth was forming, and they provide a record through time, and then they compared it to fish and small dinosaur and crocodile teeth from the same spots. Those smaller animals are expected not to migrate very much, and therefore are mostly representing the strontium environment there. And so the idea was to try to see if, these, if this one individual of the plant eater was migrating long distances or if it mostly stayed in one drainage basin. So, you have a question? Yeah, I was just going to say something about the title. If they were only analyzing an individual specimen, why did they title the paper like Cretaceous Hypersoids? Okay, right, good, good question. So the, hello, this is freezing up on me. That would be a bad thing. Let's see if this works, guys. There we go. Okay, so the title here, so the question is, um, why do they title it in hadrosaurs, plural, if you're looking at one individual? Well, a, a more thorough analysis, of course, would require a lot of individuals, oh, yeah. but you've got to start somewhere. So this is sort of the first preliminary version of this. So you're right. Uh, and they, they do admit in there, in their conclusions, uh, that this should be taken with the appropriate grain of salt or strontium or whatever, uh, because that it, it is one individual. But it shows this one individual actually didn't make long migrations, at least over the time that these teeth were forming. It actually stayed in a relatively small area, but still a broader area. This is the range of strontium isotopes here for this one individual of duckbill compared to those animals which were definitely staying in one drainage basin. But over here, I need to tighten up this mask. Over here we have HI as a hadrosaur individual, and these are the different drainage basins overall, and we see that the range of those, which are only a few hundred kilometers apart, um, aren't reflected in that one critter. So that one individual probably wasn't making huge migrations. Okay. 
So that's what we do, but let's get a little more philosophical here. What is science? So it isn't simply a body of knowledge. You know, it's not just we, we learn this thing. This is what we know. That's often, unfortunately, how it's taught. And there's reasons that's the reason it's taught. There are reasons it is taught that way. And as we have accumulated a lot of details in each field, and therefore, when we're training people in it or exploring it with other people, we often want to do this great big data dump of what do we know? You know how do these chemical reactions work? How does this, how do the chemical properties of physical objects work, etc.? But it's more than that. So here is a definition from the, um, this is the one from the American Association for the Advancement of Science. So they should know what's going on there. Um, it's the systematic acquisition and application of knowledge about the structure and behavior of the physical universe gained via empirical evidence through observation, measurement, and experimentation. And by the way, these are, this long definition is on the uh, lecture notes as well. So, um, but let's just do it. So what do we do? We are figuring out in an organized fashion, so systematic acquisition, and doing stuff with, applying, what? Knowledge, good. Knowledge about what? About the structure and behavior of the physical universe. So science covers aspects of the physical universe, how it's put together and how it operates. How do we get that knowledge? Is it through revealed wisdom or long tradition? No, it's through empirical ever evidence. We'll talk about empiricism in a bit. Through observation, measurement, and experimentation. So observation and measurement, two very closely related things we'll get to. Experimentation is what we do with those data. Data would be another word for observation and measurement. Um, experimentation is how we apply that. So if you think about that, the various um, papers I presented weren't simply, what do we know? It was, we had, a, we had thoughts about something, we took some observations, we did something typically mathematical with them, and tried to figure out what it means about this particular situation. Or here's another phrase, it's a type of inquiry into nature characterized by the availability of empirically testable hypotheses. So it's about asking questions, so inquiry, about what? About nature again, so nature, physical, universe, synonyms. And it, we characterize science by the use of empirically testable hypotheses. So questions, we'll talk about hypotheses some more, that we can evaluate testable through observations, empirical. Now, the word science itself is indeed related to knowledge. Uh, the Latin scio is I know, and hence scientia, the origin of the word science, is knowledge. And so when people in, say, library science use that word, it's a perfectly legitimate use of the word science. It is the organized knowledge about how we uh, put together, systematize the printed word or now a printed word and other media. So it's a legitimate use of science there, but it's not this use of science. No one makes dramatic breakthroughs in our understanding of that organization. Or what we do, it's through creativity. It's not through some sort of empirical, someone does, 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 does do some measurement of, oh my god, everything we know about classifying books is wrong. No, that's not how it works. But when we talk about Natural sciences, physical sciences, this is the sort of thing that we're dealing with here. Okay, now why do we have to have science? Why can't we just have knowledge the way it is? You know, we find something and just go with it. And that's because we face a real danger. It's called confirmation bias. So this is not a scientist here. It's not a scientist in the context that, uh, that I was using it. This is a theologian, so a philosopher about the nature of the divine, um, so it's outside the realm of you know, the natural sciences, but it's still spot on, because all sorts of fields, it's human nature to have confirmation bias, to look for stuff that is consistent with your previous held beliefs and ignore stuff that contradicts them. And so as he says here, Bart Ehrman says, people almost always find what they're expecting to find 
if they allow their expectations to guide their search. It's just human nature. And so we want to avoid that. Or um, someone else who worked with, um, with things beyond nature, um, in this case, fantasy stuff, the great um, fantasist of the late 20th and earliest 21st century, Terry Pratchett, uh, most famous for his Discworld novels, but he's one of the co-authors of Good Omens. Some of you may have seen the, the TV version of Good Omens, or maybe read the book. Um, and he says, science is not about building a body of known facts. It's a method for asking awkward questions and subjecting them to a reality check, and thus avoiding the human tendency to believe whatever makes us feel good. Now, humans see patterns in nature. We can't help it. It's actually how we evolved. In fact, one thing that we've really evolved for is seeing faces. We can't help seeing faces. In fact, honest to goodness, if you don't see faces here, there is something wrong with you. And I don't mean that in a judgmental way. I mean, there is something outside the human perceptive norm if you, in you if you don't have the hint of faces here. At the opposite end of the you know, human perceptive spectrum, if you see these faces and you think they really are human faces and communicating with you, that actually is another set of, of mental conditions. It's so the over-attribution of the things. But the vast majority of us, sort of the vast majority of the middle of the bell curve, will know that's a building, and this is some organism, and this is actually a sponge. Because that's what SpongeBob really looks like. Um, those are clearly not human faces, but we perceive a face there, because we see patterns in nature. It helps us to see patterns in nature. People who didn't see you know, patterns would die because you wouldn't know, is this thing something good I can eat? No, that's poisonous. You know, is that spotty animal, that big cat with the spots in it, going to be my friend? No, it's going to kill me. And those individuals didn't live on to have kids. But it always maybe benefited people to have a little overactive perceptive patterns. Because maybe you missed out on an opportunity, but you lived. And so we have a tendency to oversee patterns that are real. And so we need some sort of methods to sort out between real patterns and false patterns, and sometimes, maybe not that level, but to tease out the relative support of patterns that are possible, but we can't really tell if they're real or false. Say, which ones should we consider more likely, and which ones should we consider less likely? And that method is science. So as the great physicist uh, Richard Feynman said, science is what we do to keep from lying to ourselves. Because Confirmation bias, that's what it really is about. It's lying to ourselves. In other words, science is founded in skepticism. Now, skepticism is not cynicism. It's not the rejection of all ideas. It's not, well, I'm cool, I'm not going to believe it. It's, it's from skeptos, which means to look at in Greek. So it means that you evaluate things. You check things out. You withhold judgment until you see sufficient evidence. Now, you've all probably heard of the scientific method. You know, it's, it's common enough that you can meme it out. But the thing is, there isn't just one scientific method. There are many different pathways we can use to go through that. They, they, they will typically have these different questions or uh, aspects to it, but you know, this is overly organized. Um, the other thing, again, what we want to do is we want to avoid using um, our emotions or our preconceptions to come to the conclusion. We should let the data help us come to the conclusion. So this is how not to do dinosaur research. My powerful brain has come up with a topic for my paper. Great. I'll write over the debate over tyrannosaurs, where they fear some predators or disgusting scavengers. Which side will you defend? Oh, I believe they were fearsome predators, definitely. How come? It's just so much cooler that way. I, I have written this paper, uh, but however, I hope that when I wrote it, uh, I actually use good evidence and not simply the fact that I think tyrannosaurs are awesome. In other words, you hope it's grounded in empiricism. That is observation. And as you say in the field, picks, or it didn't have, okay. You know, this is a, a dated phrase now, but back 10 years ago, this would have been funny. Okay. And in fact, how we um, do that, the main way is technically called in philosophy, oh my God, philosophy here, the hypothetical deductive method. 
So we look at data. We see observations about the natural world. So we've got empirical information coming into our senses or our modified senses. And we start to notice that there are patterns in a set of observations. And so we create a hypothesis. A hypothesis is not an educated guess, or rather, in sciences, or for that matter, the academics in general. A hypothesis isn't simply an educated guess. It's a formal statement of a pattern that appears to exist in a set of observations. For instance, we could say, all swans are white. And when we're, I know you're looking at this, so, which European people could have come to that conclusion for centuries and centuries, because all the swans that inhabit the European part of Eurasia, in fact, most of Eurasia, are indeed white. And so they saw data, they came up with a hypothesis. And the nice thing about the hypothesis is it is a testable hypothesis. It is capable of being refuted. It's what we call falsifiable. Falsifiable doesn't mean false. It means it could be shown to be false. For instance, the way to falsify the hypothesis, all swans are white, is to observe a black swan. And finally, you know, European uh, explorers get to Australia. They see that the Australians were very much well aware that they were black swans because they'd been living next to them for you know, 60,000 years. And OK, that hypothesis was incorrect. So scientific inquiry proceeds from the formulation of hypotheses, statements of patterns, that are based on previous observations, but that's not enough. You then have to take those hypotheses and test them with additional observations. And in fact, you wind up not proving hypotheses. A hypothesis cannot be proven on a philosophical level, because that would require infinite knowledge of all things at all times under all conditions, and no mind can do that. But we can provisionally accept it when, after repeated tests, repeated observations, we fail to disprove it. But we have to keep in our back pocket the idea that there might be observations which could disprove it at a future date. Because we want them to be falsifiable. We don't want our hypotheses to be false. We want them to be falsifiable. No one wants to come up with a hypothesis and have it proven false because we're human beings and our hypotheses are our beings. But we have to be aware that what we're trying to do is disprove them. So they have to be falsifiable. And just another way, if, you, if the word falsifiable is unappealing to you, call it testable. There must be some sort of way you can evaluate it. We call that an experiment. Experiments need not have lots of bottles and Bunsen burners and flasks or big, giant machines, Van de Graaff generators with lightning going between them, although they can. It's simply a way of subjugating your hypothesis to additional tests with new observations. And there must be some way you can evaluate it to show that it is wrong. Or we have to have this, uh, being falsifiable or testable means if you were wrong, how would you know it? There must be some way that you would know that it's wrong. OK, I've been sort of philosophical here. Let's just take a real example. So far, after um, you know, 150 years or so of paleontological work in Africa, maybe not as intensely done as in some other parts of the world, but some people have been exploring African fossils in the context of paleontology, we're on the order of 150 years. No one has yet encountered fossils of the horned dinosaurs, the ceratopsids, from that continent. Now, those horned dinosaur fossils are common in North America during what's the last 15 million years of the late Cretaceous. They are present, although rare, in Asia, but we haven't found any in Africa. So if I put forward the hypothesis um, there were ceratopsids in Africa in the last 15 million years, the late Cretaceous. That's actually a testable hypothesis. Or rather, is it? 
Think about that. Let's say I go out to the field and I dig it up. And I, I dig and I don't see one. Have I shown that this is correct? No. You know, I go out in the field for one season, I don't find it. Doesn't mean that it's a true statement. How about I go out for 10 years and I don't find it? No. We're talking about limited data. The chance exists that I didn't find it. Perfectly reasonable. In fact, a properly falsifiable hypothesis is there were no ceratopsids in Africa in the last 15 million years of the Lake Cretaceous Epoch. It's asking the same thing, but by reformulating, by restating the case, this is now a hypothesis that can be overturned with a single discovery. All you need is one discovery, and it's demonstrated to be false. Um, so here's the irony. NASA spends billions of dollars building equipment to test the hypothesis there is no life on Mars, or there is no life on Europa. Now, really, they're asking the question, is there life on Mars, or is there life on Europa? But the way you do the experiment is design it so that if you discover the presence of something we call life, it would register, and therefore we could reject the hypothesis. There is no life there. But if you say, technically, you know, we're building it, says, is there life there? And you fail to find life after the first probe, or the second probe, or the tenth probe, that doesn't mean it's not in some other part of the, of the planet. So I know that's a weird way of thinking about it, but that's the way it actually proceeds. Now, not all hypotheses are falsifiable. Many are subjective, and therefore not scientific. So the hypothesis that chocolate is better than vanilla is absolutely true, but it is not falsifiable. It's subjective. And as I say better, I didn't say more people prefer chocolate to vanilla. That is a testable hypothesis. You can do surveys. But I'm saying it's better. So that deals with some subjective statement. And some, are in, some might be testable in principle, but can't be tested at present because of limitations. And those are speculations. For instance, life may well exist on worlds orbiting Alpha Centauri or Epsilon Eridani or whatever. But we don't have instrumentation that could possibly evaluate those because we don't even see the planets of those places yet. We know some, you know, some exoplanets in other stars. We have more of them on other stars in our, in our own solar system. But we don't resolve the details of those worlds yet, only the things about their mass and their speed around their star. Or let's take this one. Dinosaurs clearly had color. They weren't in sepia tones. It wasn't the 1950s. Back when I was young, we'd see all those old 1950s TV shows, and they were all in black and white. So we thought, yeah, back, back when my mom was a kid, everything was in black and white. No, it wasn't. Um, but um, yeah, so dinosaurs had colors. But in most cases, we can't know what those colors were. Turns out we know in some cases, or oh, there's aspects of it. We'll talk about that later on. But for the most part, we have to speculate on the colors. And indeed, that speculation is fine, but we shouldn't come to additional conclusions based on it. You know, we shouldn't have hypotheses based on you know, this color pattern versus this color pattern in Deinonychus antiropus, because we have no way of evaluating if either of those are true. That cousin. Now, of course, in order to get to that level, we need to do the first basic stuff, which is description. You know, measurements, or observations, or data. They're all pretty much the same thing. We want to describe the objects we're talking about. In our, my case, it's fossils. In an astronomer's case, it might be data coming from their telescopes or their probes, uh, and whatever. So we want to first have something to talk about. And if possible, it would be great to quantify it in some meaningful, repeatable fashion. Turn it into numbers. Give some sort of measurement that other people can then use to compare. So that's why I'm taking you know, measurements of toe bones and other bones with calipers there, as I can then publish those data. So the observations are described in enough detail to make them comparable from study to study. Now, a consequence of this means that science 
tends to use a lot of jargon. The jargon, and you'll find, well, you're just doing it for gatekeeping. No. That's not the reason. The reason is to make something that is usable in a very precise fashion from person to person to person to person. We need to be just that, precise and unambiguous in that terminology so we know we're comparing apples to apples. And as a consequence, it winds up being rather technical terminology. But that's, that's the breaks. If we make it vague, then you don't know that you're talking about the same thing. So that's the reason we have you know, technical terms for anatomy and technical terms for aspects of classification and so forth, because we want to be really precise with that. Now, paleontology is one of many historical or forensic sciences. It's not something where we can go and actually you know, watch the animals acting now because they're dead. But it, just because something is a historical science doesn't mean it's not science. Just because you don't do it in a lab with a lot of bubbling fluids doesn't mean it's not science. After all, astronomy is all historical. When we look at stars, those stars we're seeing light from them years to thousands of years, to millions of years ago. When we look at archaeology, those cultures are dead or gone for the most part. And yet we can, come, we can get observations of them, test them, and come to conclusions. Just as a crime scene investigation unit collects forensic data to solve a crime. So that's testing a hypothesis. You know, we don't have to redo the crime. We don't have to kill so-and-so again in order to try to figure out who killed them. That would be unethical. And so these observed data we have are essentially clues. That's what we're looking for, clues. You want to think about it that way. But the data themselves are typically only useful when you put them into a context. We have some form of data analysis where the observations are compared to each other. This is relative brain size of different types of dinosaurs. The ones in red are in the carnivorous group. The ones in blue are plant eaters. And they're scaled on the one side against relative brain size and on the other side against geological time. And we might uncover some patterns here and therefore test multiple different hypotheses. Here it has to do with the relative abundance and sizes of dinosaurs on the one branch, dinosaurs and their cousins called Ava metatarsalia, and the proto-crocodile lineage. And we see that they had different degrees of diversity and size, average size, at different points in their history. And so the sum of observations and the results of our analyses is what we call evidence. So that's what we're trying to do. Evidence relevant to the topic. The raw observations and then the cooked observations, if you will, the observations after they've gone through analyses. And so we go from the evidence to our inferences to our conclusions. We shouldn't, as the saying goes, jump to conclusions. We should get there in a methodical fashion. And that way, other people can approach the same question and perhaps find a logical or a methodological flaw in our approach to those conclusions and say, you can't, be, you can't consider those conclusions sound because you made some big mistakes on the way. That's why a lot of scientific papers have to do with talking about the data you collected, the methods you used, the values you found from your analysis, and so forth, so other people can double check. I'll tell you, when you're actually reading most papers, most of the time, you read the intro stuff, you glance through that middle stuff, and then you read the heart of it at the end, which is the discussion and the conclusions, because that's what you're interested in. But you do have to go back to that middle stuff just to make sure that they're justified in getting to where they got to the end. So trying to evaluate these sorts of things, these conclusions, we have some tools that we can use. The most famous of these is what's called parsimony, or Occam's razor. William of Occam was a theologian, a priest in the Middle Ages. He wasn't actually the first person to state this, but he gave a famous formulation of this idea in Latin, so we're not going to deal with that here, uh, that people have used ever since. Parsimony literally means stinginess. But in this context, it's the idea that all other things being equal, we choose the simpler of the potential explanations, the one that requires the fewest additional assumptions. 
It probably requires some assumptions, almost certainly, but we want to choose the ones with the fewest. So if we have a spread of data, and we can explain it with a simple linear regression, a straight line, that's typically going to be preferable to one that has a 12th order polynomial regret, uh, equation to explain it. It might, that second one might go through the data points better, but that's a very complex one with a lot of unjustified assumptions. The parsimonious explanation is not necessarily true, but it's a good rule of thumb to go with that until you have reason not to. Now, a term people have heard a little less often, I think, than parsimony is consilience. Consilience is unity of knowledge. The idea that all of the things being equal, we prefer the hypotheses which are consistent with previously established knowledge and or don't contradict previously established knowledge. Okay, got six minutes. So consilience. Now, on the one hand, we might feel this a little constraining, but, you know, if your explanation for something requires something dramatically weird to be different about the world than was previously established, you darn well better have some really good evidence for that. In fact, you probably should be testing that other thing and not the smaller thing you're looking at right then. So to give an example of that, in, the, uh, in Nevada, at, near, at a ghost town called Berlin, like Berlin, um, there are fossil sites of creatures from the Triassic, from the early age of dinosaurs. They're not dinosaurs, but they're ichthyosaurs. They're giant marine reptiles, sort of dolphin-shaped, although in this case, dolphin-shaped, but up to about the size of a, well, between a killer whale and a, a sperm whale for this particular species. And there are many skeletons of them found at this site. So there's a state park that's made for them, where you can go and see those skeletons in spot, in place. We can see these strings of vertebrae, of backbones here. Now, the traditional interpretation is that this was a beaching event, as happens with whales and dolphins today, that a, a pod of these, of multiple individuals, were washed ashore, died, and were buried together. And that's why they're lined up because of tidal effects and wave effects. However, about 10 years ago, a scientist looking at these said, you know what this reminds me of, these pattern of vertebrae? It reminds me of the suckers on the inside of the tentacles of modern cephalopods, that is squids and octopods. What we also know, he said, that some octopods will arrange little things around their home it's the octopus's garden. That's, you know, you know, the old Beatles song, the octopus's garden in the shade. And so he came to this conclusion that there was a giant, it had to be a giant, because if it's moving the bodies of animals the size of a killer whale, it's got to be giant, was arranging these vertebrae around it, arranging these bodies, rather, to make a self-portrait. So a hyper-intelligent Triassic Kraken. Now, we have no other evidence of such creature. We have no evidence, even among modern cephalopods, that they are aware of their own appearance and do self-art, you know, self-portraits. Additionally, these bodies wouldn't look like this when the creatures were moving them around. If they were moving around, there would still be flesh. It's only after the rotting of the flesh and the preservation of the bones that they look like the suckers. So yeah, cool story, bro. But this is highly non-conciliant not at all consistent with previous knowledge, and highly unparsimonious because it concerns an agent, giant hyperintelligent krakens, for which there's zero other evidence. That said, it's, and additionally, there is a simpler explanation available, which is they were beached ichthyosaurs. Now, it is often good to have multiple working hypotheses and you can be testing them all simultaneously. So for instance, in this case, there are some skulls of dome-headed dinosaurs from the very end of the Cretaceous in rocks in Wyoming, Montana, South Dakota, North Dakota, all next to each other. One hypothesis is that these are three separate but related sorts of dinosaurs. 
Another hypothesis is that the one we call Draco Rex is actually just the juvenile of Stiggy Moloch, and that as it got older, it grew the dome on its head. Another hypothesis is that it is a juvenile of Pachycephalosaurus, and that as it got older, it grew an even larger dome. And the third hypothesis is that there's only one species there, and these are three different growth stages of the same species. And indeed, this is a these are multiple working hypotheses, and there are researchers currently going through the data to test between them. I will tell you, all the data points to Draco Rex not being real. It is definitely a juvenile. Is it a juvenile of one, of the other, or are they all three the same? Those remain currently evaluated, or currently being evaluated working hypotheses. Or I'll wrap this up with another case. Here is a dinosaur called Majungasaurus from Madagascar, from the end of the age of dinosaurs, a little earlier than Pachycephalosaurus. And sometimes some of their bones are found with tooth, tooth scrape marks on them. Now, it was hypothesized that these were the scrape marks of Majungasaurus eating other members of the same species. So was it a cannibal? Let's work this through a couple minutes here. Got it. The way they evaluated it is they looked at the skulls of likely of known carnivores from that formation, looked at the size of the teeth, looked at the spacing of the teeth, and then compared the size and spacing of these teeth to the scrape marks. And the crocodiles, although big, have teeth that are not evenly spaced or evenly sized. The small carnivore had teeth which were way too small. These, these bars here are scale bars of the same measurement. And indeed, the teeth best supported the idea that Majungasaurus was the one that produced those scrapes. The only one to fit that pattern. Did they prove it? No, and that's the big point I'm coming to at the end. But we provisionally accept it. Could the tooth marks be from some Majungasaurus-like predator other than Majungasaurus from the same time and place? Absolutely it could. But following the principle of parsimony, we shouldn't invent a new predator, or a scavenger in this case, for which we don't have evidence, when we have one that could fill the data. And is this consistent with the way that animals actually operate? Yes. Many carnivorous living species are cannibals, will eat bodies of their own species. So it's perfectly consistent with it. So, I'll end with this. Um, what if I told you it's okay to change your opinion based on the newest evidence? Absolutely. That's an important aspect. Now, when we come back, I'll talk about the history of paleontology. Sorry, I didn't get to that here, but at least we got through the nature of science. If you didn't scan your QR code when you came in, please do so now before you leave, just so they can start making a habit of it.